eve of grave decision on April 2nd, 1917, an anxious president, Woodrow Wilson, voices his forebodings. Once lead this people into war, and they'll forget there ever was such a thing as tolerance. To fight, you must be brutal and ruthless. Conformity would be the only virtue. Days later, with the president leading as he must, America is at war. All doubts are now submerged. All separate voices drowned out by the great chorus of the war effort. Do your bit for the boys over there. The spirit of 17 on the American home front. A nation rallying to the war. Behind them, keeping the spirit moved, is the machinery of government. A new agency set up by the president under a journalist named George Creel with his Committee on Public Information, which will grow from a handful to 150,000, Creel tackles the war effort as a plain publicity proposition, the world's greatest adventure in advertising. It will be an all-star production, offstage and on. The March King, John Philip Sousa, drumming up sales of Liberty Bonds, with the star of the Metropolitan Opera, Anna Case, as soloist. Booth Tarkington, author of the bestseller Penrod, writes on American facts and German propaganda. Young novelist Edna Ferber turns out press releases for distribution to the Allies. So does America's preeminent man of letters, William Dean Howells, in behalf of the Creel Committee's Foreign Press Bureau. Mary Pickford and other stars of the infant medium, the movies, make personal appearances as salesmen for Uncle Sam. Comedienne Marie Dressler in a gesture of warning to Kaiser Bill. to weld the people of the United States into one white-hot mass, instinct with fraternity, devotion, courage, and deathless determination. This is the mission in the words of George Creel. The country's artists are told, draw till it hurts. The draft, starting in July 1917, makes potential heroes of some three million men who will be called on to do their bit in uniform. Billy Sunday, the National League outfielder turned evangelist, tours the country with inspiring sermons. Rout the enemy. Upset autocracy and set up liberty throughout the world. The president, who suffered such forebodings at the prospect of war, calls for force. Force without stint or limit. Righteous and triumphant force. Untouched by battle, the American landscape is altered by the war. Washington, once described as a drowsy capital, becomes a boom town in 1917. This is the time in American history when government grows into big government, spending almost as much on the 20-month war as in the previous century and a quarter of its history. Dozens of new agencies, a federal payroll that nearly doubles from 500,000 employees to almost a million, not to mention the unpaid volunteers. Liberty bonds, Allied Relief, Red Cross, Scores of wartime causes. For just one dollar a year, government secures the services of some of its most distinguished citizens, an army of businessmen like Thomas A. Edison and Bernard Baruch, 
One observer calls Washington a patriotic madhouse. One of the new faces in government, Herbert Hoover, organizer of worldwide relief for Belgium in 1915, now summoned to run the food program at home. Battalions of volunteers work farms and plant war gardens to help feed the nation and the Allies. For housewives, the watchwords are, save food. The public translates it into Hooverize. Out in the field, for women and youngsters, the slogan is, do a man's job. Love may not change, but motherhood will never be the same after this war. America's women, taking on a man's job, work up new arguments to support their demands for the vote. Demands that will be fulfilled in a constitutional amendment after the war. How are you going to keep them out of the voting booth after they've helped win the war? Along with its heroes and heroines, the war effort produces new villains. This scene takes place in Birmingham, Alabama, a slacker driven out of town by his neighbors. With the draft strictly policed, the penalties of being a slacker are severe. Slogans grow into passions, a hatred of all things German. A Harvard professor finds in Wagner's music the traits of war, lust, and cunning. Shops owned by German-Americans are boycotted, sometimes wrecked. Sauerkraut becomes liberty cabbage. In the schools of 14 states, teaching German is banned, and President Wilson worries that the war spirit may become the mob spirit. Nine months of American participation in the war four whole divisions shipped overseas, more units leaving every week, and no visible impact on the stalemate on the Western Front. Impatient for news of victories, the public has received only reports of the first American deaths. The spirit of over there is becoming muted. The farewells grow somber. The materiel of the home front, coal and food, is stalled in transit as the nation's railroads, burdened by a long history of mismanagement, further strained by labor shortages and strikes, finally break down. Even on the home front, every day is a battle. War production sputters under a variety of handicaps. Competing for materials and manpower, or any reasonable substitute, industry operates under conflicting plans by a welter of government committees. Washington's patriotic madhouse has become a bureaucratic madhouse. An economic czar, Bernard Baruch, is empowered by Wilson to get war industry out of its doldrums. By government fiat, production gets rolling. Baruch and his War Industries Board, armed with extraordinary powers, reporting directly to the president, keep the economy disciplined with a tough regime of priorities. It is a pattern alien to America. Business by government regulation. Less steel for auto parts. None for corsets. More for guns. Less cloth for blouses, more for airplane fuselages.
Even with the speed up, industry will never quite catch up with the war. In a single ceremonious day, 4th of July, 1918, 95 ships are launched. But none will cross the Atlantic by the time of the armistice. British shipping will carry most of the load. Nor will any American-made tank get into action. The American Expeditionary Force will fight with French and British tanks and artillery, while the bugs are being worked out over here. It is late in the war before the arsenal of democracy is really geared up for the business of war, its problems of manpower and material settled. One new source of industrial manpower is the Negro, recruited from the South by the thousands, giving up 50 or 75 cents a day jobs for the lure of higher paid war work in the North. migration, which will have a profound effect on the course of American life, is accompanied by conflict. Race riots in northern communities like Philadelphia, Chicago, and East St. Louis, Illinois, where 37 Americans are killed, white and Negro. Another kind of disease is loose in the land. Suspicion, attacking all forms of dissent. Vigilantes, operating in the name of patriotism, pursue their own blacklist of enemies. Draft dodgers and war bond slackers. Pacifists who condemn war. Labor groups that insist on voicing discontent. The foreign born. Wilson's fears of a brutalized, conformist America loom over the nation. The government acts to take the law out of the hands of the mob. The Wilson administration, under criticism as soft on pro-Germans, seeks and gets tough new laws suppressing freedom of speech and opinion. One controversial labor group, the Industrial Workers of the World, the Wobblies, is violently suppressed by mob and government. In Arizona, 1,200 members are expelled en masse to an army post in New Mexico for their preachments and practice of strike with anarchist overtones. Elsewhere, IWW offices are raided by federal agents, their officers arrested, including Big Bill Haywood, their leading figure. Socialist party leader Eugene V. Debs, who got nearly a million votes for President of the United States in 1912, is arrested for a speech considered obstructive to the war effort, is later sentenced to 10 years in jail. With the prosecution of the dissidents, Wilson has both crushed the anti-war spirit and appeased the extremists. America's answer to the threat from abroad, the threat of the German armies, also becomes more vigorous in the summer of 1918. Doubts of national conscience, fears about security, are dimmed by triumphant scenes from the Western Front. The AEF is in action to the hilt, joining the Allies in driving back the Germans' last offensive.
Woodrow Wilson, who feared that war would prove an enemy of liberty, has compromised with that enemy. But in the promising autumn of 1918, the nation does not sense this. What Americans feel is an irresistible strength of purpose. The army is on the march in France. The nation is in step over here. <laughs>